Good day, fellow librarians and friends of Liberia. Today is June 14, 2014. My name is Deeflo Flama II, your moderator, and this is Liberia Destiny Debaters. That's all. Seeking Liberia's destiny through Sewat public political discourses in its totality. Peter threats, insults, name calling, or personal attacks. Our guest tonight is Councillor Stephen M. Chamber, a U.S. lawyer hired by the Liberian government, the Republic, the government of the Republic of Liberia. Councillor, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you on tonight. We know that uh, there are a lot of people that are going to be calling all over the place from Liberia in, in a diaspora. Again, on behalf of Liberia Destiny Debaters, I would like to say thank you for accepting our invitation. Well, but let's time. get into it. The first question is going to come from my end. I have the only question that you will take from me. Liberia has a history of corruption, which goes back to 18, 1822. Now, why is it that this case, the case against Ellen Corcoran and George Johnson, has become a case where we see a Liberian, a U.S. lawyer is involved in it? Why is it that this case has come this far to the extent that uh, we now see a lawyer from the United States getting involved? What is the message that uh, uh, the, uh, the government is trying to send or the American people are trying to send to Liberians who go to Liberia and maybe get involved in corruption and run by to the United States? What message are we well, the is, sending to Liberians? The message is that fleeing the country and coming to the United States will not guarantee uh, the uh, immunity of uh, people who are engaged in acts of corruption. Uh, as, you, as you know, and I'm sure you're, you're, many of your listeners know, um, the United States and Liberia have had an extradition treaty in place since 1939. Uh, and for all of that time, the parties have been uh, bound to each other to um, facilitate uh, the return from Liberia to the United States or from the United States to Liberia of people who are accused of criminal conduct in one or the other country. So what's happening here is nothing unusual or extreme. What is happening here is simply uh, the government of Liberia pursuing its own uh, indictment process uh, overseas within the terms of a bilateral treaty between the two countries. Thank you, Consulate. Uh, Consulate, uh, just before we take our first question, I would like for you to go ahead and introduce yourself, sir. And tell us a little bit about yourself first. I'm sorry, I introduced myself, did you say? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, um, my name is Stephen Schneebaum. I am a partner in a law firm in Washington, D.C. Um, I have been practicing international law in Washington since 1976. Um, and I have been uh, involved in uh, various human rights-related activities, uh, including um, an interest in Liberia that stems from the mid-1980s. Uh, my first visit to Liberia was in 1986, uh, when I was there uh, with a, a human rights uh, NGO delegation, non-government organization delegation, uh, monitoring the trial of a uh, couple of individuals who had been accused of being involved in the coup attempt that took place in Liberia in November of 1985. Uh, and it was through that that I met for the first time uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, uh, who, of course, at that time was, uh, was working at the World Bank, uh, but was already seen as uh, a potential leader for a democratic Liberia. Uh, and I came to know her a bit during the 1980s. And uh, of course, I've followed, as we all have, followed her career uh, since then, uh, culminating not only in her uh, election and then re-election as president of the republic, but culminating also in her recognition uh, as a uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Um, so um, I also teach international law. I've taught at a number of colleges and universities, uh, most of them in the Washington area, uh, and I have been teaching at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies uh, for 24 years. I've written quite a lot and spoken quite a lot on international legal topics, most of them related to human rights, uh, and that has been an important part of my practice and, and an important interest of mine uh, as long as I've been practicing law. 
Thank you, Councillor uh, uh, Shinobori. Uh, uh, forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, wrong here. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Stephen is much easier, so let's do that. Okay, let's go with Stephen. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Labrador Destiny Debaters. It's a privilege to be hosting tonight Councillor Stevens, who is a lawyer representing the government of Liberia in the case against Ellen Corcoran and George Mavin Johnson. Councillor, we're going to go to the line and take our first question here, so you're going to hear the time from your end. Uh, let's see here. Uh, please go ahead and that's that 61 if you have questions or uh, questions for Councillor Stevens here. Uh, Councillor, let's take the first one. The first one will come from 2582. Your name away, calling from. Yes, hi, my name is Dakama Rex, uh, calling from the Maryland DC area. Welcome yes, to the show. Thank you. Councillor Steve, I got a question for you. Uh, sure. <clears throat> my question has to do with uh, two Americans. One of them uh, is a member of the Department of uh, Defense. She, she's a pilot. And so my, my concern is that do you think the Department of Justice is going to release a lady with a top security clearance to the Liberian government for persecution, fearing that uh, she could be tortured to gain uh, access to top secret information? Do you think they will want to take that chance? Well, I hope they will. Um, I think that the United States has always had a, a policy that um, it will enter extradition treaties only with countries uh, whose judicial system it trusts. And so I, I'm quite confident that if the United States had reason to believe that a person extradited to Liberia would be mistreated in some way, uh, the answer might be different. However, given the profile of this case, it seems to me that if Ellen Corcoran and Melvin Johnson are extradited to Liberia, I would think it's uh, fairly clear uh, that they are going to be treated well. They're going to be treated in accordance with Liberian law, which in turn uh, includes respect for internationally guaranteed human rights. Um, if they are put on trial in Liberia, they will have the right to counsel. They will have the right to compel the attendance of witnesses. They will have the right to confront their accuser, all of the rights that are guaranteed by the Liberian Constitution and, incidentally, also by the United States Constitution. Now, certainly the caller makes a good point. Uh, Ms. Corcoran um, is a, a person of, uh, apparently at least, of great accomplishment um, in, uh, in her educational background, her military career, to which the caller referred. Um, but um, the case against her in Liberia is not accusing her of being a bad person. It's accusing her of certain specific acts which uh, a grand jury in Monserrato County has indicted her for uh, having committed. Now, she may very well not be guilty of those crimes. And if she's not guilty, she will be acquitted and she will be free to go about her business. The question here is, is not uh, convicting her in the United States. The question is simply transporting her from the United States to Liberia, where she will stand trial according to the tenets of Liberian law. Thank you, Councillor uh, Stevens. Councillor, uh, we're going to take the next one here. Let's go to quarter. Let's take quarter two, three. Let's two, three, five, nine. Your name, where you calling from? Hello, three, two, five, nine. Yes, that's you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Brother Seon. This is Emmanuel Park calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, welcome my, to the show. My question to Councillor Stevens is that uh, I would like you to a little bit elaborate on the framework of the extradition treaty between the U.S. and Liberia. That part A of my question. Part B is, if George Johnson and Ms. Cochran have not mobilized Liberian to give 26 reasons for the corrupt government of Ellen Salif Johnson to resign, what, or do you think the government of Liberia tell about President Ellen Johnson Sally was going to pursue this extradition treaty. Thank you. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think, again, as I, as I said earlier, I think that um, the United States extradites people to uh, countries in which um, they will be treated in accordance with internationally guaranteed standards. Um, and in this case, I, I certainly recognize 
that Ms. Corcoran and Mr. Johnson have made all sorts of allegations of corruption and misconduct on the part of the Johnson Sirleaf administration. I must say that that's not uh, a unique situation. Uh, it is certainly uh, it has certainly been known to happen before that if someone is being prosecuted, uh, one part of their defense may be to allege that those doing the prosecuting are corrupt or uh, or have been bribed or have somehow been uh, reached by improper means. Um, but I, I know that the United States State Department follows uh, general events in Liberia fairly closely, and I've certainly never seen any indication from the Department of State or, for that matter, from the Department of Justice suggesting any kind of corroboration of the kinds of allegations that uh, Ms. Corcoran and Mr. Johnson uh, have been making. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I think it's a, the best defense is often a good offense. And one way of attempting to defend yourself against charges is to attack the person making the charges. Uh, that's standard operating procedure for many people. But that doesn't mean that uh, there is any uh, counter argument to the request for extradition unless and until the United States government loses faith in um, Monrovia and in the Johnson Sirleaf administration, and that hasn't happened. Thank, thank you very you. much for that answer. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, your question will answer, so is that right? Well, yeah, let me just uh, kind of clear a little something out. Uh, the reason I ask this question is uh, I have high regard, regard for President Johnson. I respect her as the first woman in Africa, you know, to be president, you know, for the continent, and I respect that. But the fact of the matter here is her government is very brutal and very violent, in, I mean, as compared to the pre, her predecessor. So my fear here is extraditing these two innocent Liberians back to Liberia. I want you to be able to tell this forum what is any sense of our security that you can guarantee for them. Well, that's a, that's a fair question. I don't know what kind of guarantees can be offered, uh, although, I, again, as I mentioned, I think that the profile of this case is sufficiently high that uh, these are not people who are going to disappear. These are not people who are going to, to, to go into some kind of black hole and never be heard from again. Uh, these are people who's, uh, who's, who have, know how to use the media, and they have used the media well uh, to defend themselves and to attack those who are who are uh, alleging that they committed these crimes. Um, I, I don't know what, if any, special uh, method uh, the government of Liberia would be prepared to, uh, to guarantee uh, with respect to their security. Uh, but I dare say if, that, if, if the issue were simply their safety on their return, if they were willing, for example, to drop their opposition to the indictment and return to Liberia, I'm sorry, drop their opposition to the extradition and return to Liberia voluntarily, I am quite confident that it would be possible to come up with an agreement uh, whereby their safety, their physical safety, uh, would be protected. And uh, I I have no authorization uh, to make any kind of offer in that regard, but it just strikes me as logical since the government wants them to be returned to Liberia, wants to put them on trial in Liberia, uh, the government would certainly be responsible before uh, before the United States and before the world for any kind of, uh, of misadventure that they might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. We're going to take the next one. Our next question will come from Cutter. Let's take Cutter. Uh, yeah, please, uh, we are not going to be taking text messages tonight until we decide that. Let's take Cutter 4022. Your name and where you calling from? I'm Austin S. Fella. I'm calling from Minnesota. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Council. I listened to the expose of your resume. Uh, it is a little bit uh, impressive. Thank you. But uh, I am a little bit concerned. My concern is that uh, our question to you is, have you done any feasibility study on Liberia legal system before taking this case? One. Two. If so, if you read the human rights abuses that the international community and international organizations have established against the government of Ellen Johnson Solid. Three, if so, have you also read 
the corruption charges that this government has upon itself, Ellen Salif herself said that her government is corrupt. If so, you as a decent lawyer, based on what you just said, why are you involving yourself in such a government that is corrupt or has been charged uh, with, with, with human rights abuses? Thank you. All right. Well, uh, let me answer that last part of that question first. Um, yes, it is the case that uh, the president of Liberia has acknowledged um, that Liberia has a uh, history uh, of corruption in its judiciary. It's un unfortunately, that's not unique. It's not unusual. I know that even in her second inaugural address, uh, President Johnson Sirleaf pointed to the fact that uh, this a culture of corruption uh, has Hello? got to be left behind if Liberia is going to progress. And I think that's true all across the developing world. Um, and I think that this administration has, in fact, made major strides in the direction of uh, combating corruption. Now, can it be said that, uh, that Liberia's judiciary, Liberia's uh, administration is absolutely transparent and perfect? Well, no, it's, uh, Liberia is not yet Denmark or New Zealand, um, but um, Liberia is an ally of the United States. The United States is committed to the progress of Liberia, to the promotion of democracy and human rights in Liberia, and to the elimination in Liberia, as in many countries across the developing world, the elimination of the kinds of endemic corruption and endemic bribery and endemic graft that has been seen uh, around the world, sadly. Now, I would also add, incidentally, that... Um, uh, part of the, uh, or let, let me put it this way, looking at this case from the other side, one might well say that if the government did not pursue Ellen Corcoran and Melvin Johnson in the context of this indictment, the government might well be accused of condoning corruption, of looking the other way in an instance of corruption. And, you know, so you, you, you can't please all the people all the time. Um, the government now is pursuing this case precisely because it is a case of corruption that the government has become aware of and that it cannot ignore. Again, is it perfect? No, certainly not. Neither is the United States. Um, neither is any country on the planet. Uh, but uh, but the, the notion of fighting corruption and defending the rule of law uh, is an important notion to this administration in Monrovia, and, and let's hope it is one that, that takes root and that grows, uh, and that grows all over the African continent. Thank you, Councillor uh, Stephen. Councillor Stephen, we're going to take the next caller here. Let's go to Anonymous Caller. Welcome to the show. Um, thank you. Good evening, D. Flo, and good, good evening. evening. Good evening, Professor. How are you? Good evening. Okay, this is Sia. Um, I'm calling to ask a question, which I probably um, may know the answer to, but just to edify, I guess, the uh, audience. I know that extradition procedures are essential tools for international law enforcement, as well as a major um, element of international cooperation, um, specifically the principle of dual criminality. Um, in extradition laws requires in its application that the alleged crime for which the extradition is being sought be punishable in both the requesting state and the requested state, you know, like the U.S. and Liberia. Therefore, yes. why can't they both, Melvin Johnson and Ellen um, Cochran, be trialed in the U.S., which I assume will be in civil court, if possible? Well, the the answer to that question is that dual criminality means simply that if the offense had been committed in the requested state, it, the act would have been a crime. It doesn't mean that the, that the act is criminal in both states and therefore can be prosecuted in both states. Let's take a very simple case. Imagine that we were dealing with a murderer. Imagine that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that there was a murder committed in, on the streets of London and the person mm -hmm. fled, the accused criminal, fled to the United States and an extradition request was presented uh, by the government of the United Kingdom. The, the killing of a person on the streets of London is not a crime in the United States. 
Um, and, and therefore, when we talk about dual criminality, we simply mean that the act of murder is a crime in both countries and therefore can be the subject of extradition. It doesn't mean, in other words, that the United States will enforce English criminal law, or in this case, Liberian criminal law, in its own courts. Uh, to, to sort of bring that point home, the, the conclusion is that an act of corruption or graft or, or government misconduct in Liberia does not become a crime in the United States under the American mm -hmm. legal system merely because the perpetrator happens to find herself or himself in the United States. If it were otherwise, we wouldn't need extradition treaties ever. Exactly. All that we would need would be a notice from the government, in my example, of the United Kingdom saying, hey, we accuse uh, John Smith of having committed a crime uh, on the streets of London, and we know he's, he's living in New York City. Please arrest him and put him on trial. There would never be a need to transport a person from uh, the requested to the requesting state. Right. So, therefore, I mean, it would be, if, the, if it were the other way around, it could be that it would be a civil matter. It could be a civil matter here in the U.S., not a criminal matter, of course. Based well, on it the could conceivably right? be. Um, exactly. There could be, I, I guess, uh, a civil action filed against uh, Ms. Corcoran or Mr. Johnson um, uh, in the United States, a, a, a civil case, say, to recover uh, money that was allegedly uh, purloined. That could happen, uh, and that may still happen. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. I'll see Thank you. Advice. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. We're going to take the next one. Let's take uh, quarter. Let's go to quarter eight one zero six. Your name away, quarter from. The last number is eight one zero six. Are you with us? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, uh, my uh, name welcome. is Mohammed. Mohammed Kira. I'm calling from New York. Welcome, uh, Mohammed. I just came on a yeah came on a teleconference. It seems though. Mr. Moderator, the uh, the conference tonight is like uh, the act of the government behavior in corruption in Liberia rather than Mr. Johnson and Ms. Ms. Cochran. However, I have absolutely. a question. Absolutely. The question is about uh, we have a list of things, topics at the extradition of Ellie Cochran and George Johnson that were requested by Councillor Stevens to uh, the Liberian government through Councillor Stevens. His role and uh, his letter that he sent to the General Counsel of the State Board of Georgia, indictment against Ellen Corcoran and George Johnson, the rules of professional conduct, recounts of Melvin Johnson and Ellen Corcoran's activities in Liberia, accusations of criminal misconduct. So let us focus on those areas, please. Yeah, thank you so much. That, that's so good, you know. Uh, the, my question is that, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, I don't know the mother, I don't know the name. Uh, with Mr. Johnson at this moment, how far the case going? Have they filed a case against him? Is it a criminal case or civil? I'm sorry, the case in Liberia or the case before the Georgia Bar? Here in America. Ah, no, the, the case uh, before the Georgia Bar is simply a, a complaint uh, that was filed on, on behalf of the government of Liberia and the Liberia Airport Authority. Uh, I signed that complaint as their counsel, uh, but that is not, certainly not a criminal case, and it's, uh, I suppose, technically not even a civil case. It, it's not before a court. It is simply before the state bar. And all of, all of us lawyers know that if we uh, are accused of, of doing something wrong in our professional lives, uh, that a complaint can be made to the licensing body that gives us the, the ability to practice law. Uh, in the case of, of uh, Mr. Johnson, that's the State Bar of, of Georgia. In my case, it's the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. Um, but each uh, state has its own structure governing uh, the practice of law. And in Georgia, the State Bar is the recipient of complaints that uh, the public, members of the public, may file uh, against lawyers. Very often those complaints are simple ones. Um, you know, this lawyer charged me more money than he should have, or he didn't do the work that I asked him to do, or uh, he won't return my phone calls, or whatever it is. But the State Bar is also empowered to review complaints of 
uh, any sort of professional misconduct, any violation of the rules of professional conduct of which a lawyer might be accused, and that is exactly what we have done in the case of Melvin Johnson. We have filed that kind of complaint. The bar will investigate that complaint. Uh, presumably it will hear from Mr. Johnson uh, himself in due course, uh, will hear his response to the charges, uh, and um, the court, uh, the uh, bar will make a decision as to whether uh, any disciplinary action um, is, uh, is advisable in his case. And um, uh, no doubt at that point, if it gets to that point, uh, the government of Liberia will again be asked to weigh in, and we will be ready to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to take the next one. The next one will come from Scholar 3389. Any more way you call it from? Oh, 3389? Okay, this is uh, Emmanuel. I'm calling from Boston. Welcome to the show. Yes. uh, Happy Father's Day to everybody on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my concern, uh, uh, my question would be, uh, would the uh, counselor be? I mean, will he be in Liberia if counselor? I mean, if uh, Judge Johnson and Mrs. Cochran are extradited to Liberia, will he be um, uh, defending the government in the courts in Liberia, or he's just doing it in the United States and then uh, uh, will turn the case over to to Liberian lawyers when? When, uh, when Mrs. Cochran and George Johnson are extradited to Liberia. Okay. Uh, I'm, of course, not a member of the bar of the Republic of Liberia. Uh, and, in fact, one has to be a citizen of Liberia, I understand, in order to be a member of the bar. Um, so I will have no role in the prosecution uh, once the two individuals are uh, returned to Liberia. Um, and, in fact, even in the current uh, proceedings that are going on before the court in Monserrato County, uh, I have no role. Um, as your, as listeners may know, um, some time ago, a month or so ago, maybe a bit, a bit more than that, um, lawyers in Liberia representing the two defendants moved to dismiss the indictment on the grounds that the government was not moving uh, sufficiently um, promptly uh, to obtain extradition. And just about a week or 10 days ago, uh, the court in Montserrado County denied that motion. So the um, the indictment is still alive and, and, and still pending. Uh, I had no role in, in those proceedings either. And again, I, I, I shouldn't have and wouldn't have. Um, the government's uh, legal team, headed at the moment by the Solicitor General, is, I think, a particularly strong team. I think the Solicitor General is a terrific lawyer, uh, knows very well what she's doing, and she is certainly more than capable of, of prosecuting these two individuals when and if they're returned to Liberia. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, could I ask another question, if possible? Uh, no, you have to wait. Oh, a lot of people oh, okay. So oh, okay. okay. Come, all right. come to you, please. Uh, we'll oh, all all right. Question, please. Thank you. Okay. Sir. Let's take a quarter. Let's take quarter five one five eight. Your name is where you calling from? Oh, this is Cecilia from Atlanta. Welcome to the show, Cecilia. What? Uh, counselor, I have a question for you. Okay. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, what happened to the PPCC? process in Liberia because they are supposed to oversee in in a war contracts that the Liberian government is bidding outside to a third party. But the president called you personally and gave you this contract for you to represent them. What happened to the process? Is that illegal in Liberia? Because I think this is illegal and in a violation to the PPC uh, law in Liberia. Why did she call you personally for her to give you this contract? Well, she didn't. She did call me personally, but she didn't call me to give me a contract. She called me to ask me to make a proposal, which she could then take to the PPCC in accordance with Liberian law. And I believe that that process was properly followed in Liberia. Um, and in, it's interesting that you raise the PPCC question because, of course, one of the allegations in the first count of the indictment 
uh, is that uh, in awarding the contract for the reconstruction work at Roberts Field, um, Ellen Corcoran um, not only did not follow the PPCC regulations, but in fact her request to have that contract awarded on a sole source basis was rejected by the PPCC, and yet she uh, spent government money anyway, even though not only had the PPCC not approved it, the PPCC actually said no to it. But in my case, uh, I am told um, that the Justice Ministry, uh, which is actually the one that, that, that hired me, uh, that the Justice Ministry had properly observed PPCC regulations, and I believe that they did. Thank you, Councillor. We're going to take the next one. The next one will come from 8972. Your name is from. Yes. Hello? Hello? Yes. Uh, great. Uh, this is from uh, Charlie. And, uh, Welcome to the show. You have uh, a question, one question per quarter, please. Yes, I do have a question. How are you doing, sir, uh, lawyer? Uh, here's my question. I'm very interested in knowing this. Uh, there is a legal process going on like we are regarding this case. And that process, so far as we know, have not established any wrongdoing yet on the part of these uh, these, uh, these 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 individual Johnson and both Cochrane. So how is it in the absence of such a legal process that have not established any wrongdoing? Uh, the government will not be filing in a case, especially at the bar association in uh, Georgia, and not even a court uh, extradition process to call these people back for a hearing. So I'm really interested in to understand why this approach. Uh, in the face of an ongoing legal case in Liberia, but there's no uh, there's no, no no decision from the court in Liberia. Right. Well, of course, there won't be a decision from a court in Liberia unless and until the two defendants are extradited to Liberia or until they voluntarily return to Liberia. Um, the the fact finding that would result in a conclusion that they are guilty, or for that matter, that they're not guilty of the charges against them, can only take place after a trial, and there won't be a trial again until they're physically present in Liberia. So, yes, it is certainly true that there has not been a conclusive determination of their guilt. That is certainly correct. And in the letter to the uh, State Bar of Georgia, we made it absolutely clear that there had been no judicial determination. There is no conviction. In fact, there has been no trial. And we make it absolutely clear that what we are setting out here. Uh, in our complaint to the State Bar are the allegations that are in the indictment. And the indictment is, of course, quite a, quite a serious thing. Um, but it is only an accusation, and uh, there is no question, but that like everybody else in a democratic culture, Ms. Corcoran and Mr. Johnson are innocent until proven guilty. No doubt about that. The extradition process is aimed at making it possible for that determination finally to be made. With respect to the bar complaint, um, this is, again, not a criminal proceeding. It is open to the state bar investigators to satisfy themselves as to whether they believe that the charges are more likely true than not. But bear in mind, this is a, this is a professional licensing body that we're talking about, essentially. Um, in order for someone to be convicted in a criminal court of a criminal offense, um, the state must prove every element of the charge beyond a reasonable doubt. But to suspend someone from the practice of law or to take away someone's license to practice law does not require that kind of, of, of heavy uh, burden of proof. Uh, and indeed, nobody would want it to be otherwise. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't want to know that my doctor, who's about to operate on me, um, is is probably corrupt or probably incompetent, but nobody's actually proved that beyond a reasonable doubt. That wouldn't give me much uh, much consolation. And in the practice of law, I think there's a, a higher standard of, of of fiduciary obligation of trust that lawyers are meant to uh, uh, to demonstrate. And the state bar of Georgia has a, an established disciplinary process. They certainly know the difference between a charge and a conviction, and they will undoubtedly, um, their investigation will be uh, carefully conducted, bearing in mind, as I said, that Mr. Johnson has not been convicted of any crime. 
Thank you, the, the attorney, uh, Councillor Stevens. Councillor Stevens, there are a lot of text messages coming in, so we're going to take one here, which says that uh, could you give us uh, uh, allegedly a recount of uh, George Johnson activities in Liberia, if you have activities of George Johnson and Ernie Kirkland? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question. About uh, the activities allegedly. in Liberia? Yes, uh, can you give us a recount? Can you give us a recount of the activities in Liberia? Oh, I see. You're okay, talking yes. about George um, Johnson and yes. Ellie Crocan. Yes, um, and and that uh, I may need to go on for a few minutes in answer to that one because it, it would ahead, be sir. worth. You can take you can take as uh, as much as you want to take. Sir. Okay, okay. Well, it will it will take a couple of minutes to summarize what is in the indictment because the uh, activities of of which um, they are accused, uh, you know, are the three counts of the indictment. And incidentally, Ms. Corcoran is named in all three counts. Mr. Johnson is named in only one count. So let me quickly go through what the three counts are. The first count has to do with uh, the the uh, contract that I mentioned just a moment ago um, that, had, that was a contract for uh, the repair of pavement uh, at Roberts Field International Airport. And then in that connection, Ms. Corcoran, who was, of course, managing director of the Liberia Airport Authority, apparently uh, undertook to uh, grant uh, a contract to a company headed by a man who was a classmate of hers at Harvard, at Kennedy School. Um, And uh, she did not go through proper procedures uh, for the approval of that contract. As I mentioned, the PPCC, which is the Public Procurement and Concessions Commission, uh, rejected her request uh, for authority to award that contract on a sole source basis. She went ahead and apparently did it anyway. There is no evidence, uh, or at least no reliable evidence, that uh, the company to which she awarded the contract was um, qualified to perform the work or that, in fact, it did perform the work. And, and, yeah, and, uh, and further, when she disbursed funds to that company, um, she did not go through proper procedures in obtaining counter signatures of the, uh, of the checks, the LAA checks, Um, They were uh, not signed in accordance with the instructions that the board had given to the bank. So that is the first count uh, of the indictment. The second count is the one that names uh, both Ms. Uh, Corcoran and Mr. Johnson. And this one alleges that uh, money that should have been paid to a security contractor at Roberts Field uh, somehow or other ended up uh, in Mr. Johnson's law firm's trust account. Now, Mr. Johnson uh, is a lawyer and has been in the past a um, a municipal judge, but there's no evidence to suggest that he's a security expert uh, or that he uh, is competent to perform a security audit at the airport, and therefore no conceivable reason why there would be uh, money uh, intended for security work at the airport to end up in Mr. Johnson's bank account. That doesn't make sense. And then the third count alleges that Ms. Corcoran was authorized uh, to purchase uh, computer hardware for the LAA board during her visits to the United States. She was a regular uh, visitor to the United States, even during her tenure as managing director of the airport authority. And uh, she was asked by the board um, to purchase some uh, portable electronics in the U.S. Uh, be easier and cheaper for her to purchase them here in the U.S. and, you know, put them in her baggage and take them back to Liberia rather than ordering them from Africa. Um, And she was given $19,000 with which uh, to purchase that equipment. And the equipment that she then delivered to the LAA board in Monrovia was worth nowhere close to $19,000. So those are the allegations in the complaint. Um, and um, those, those are the three sets of facts, the three incidents, if you like, that formed the basis uh, of the indictment returned by the grand jury in Montserrat County. Um, and um, in all of those cases, the, the, the sort of heading of the, uh, of the allegations is a misuse of government property. Uh, misappropriation of public funds, that sort of thing. And there are various ways, various wordings of those offenses uh, in Liberia, and just as there are various wordings in, in the different states in the United States. But essentially, the corruption allegations are of those three types. First, the uh, contract granted for the work at Roberts Field. Second, 
the um, misdirection of public funds into Mr. Johnson's trust account, and then third, uh, the failure of Ms. Corcoran to deliver to the LAA board the computer hardware that she was commissioned to purchase in the United States. Those are the activities that are in question. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Councillor uh, Councillor Stephen. Councillor Stephen, what about the issue of uh, recalling? Is that legal in Liberia? Because Liberia is a terrible country. I, I'm sorry. Again, I'm having, I, I'm, I'm hearing the callers uh, more easily than I'm hearing you. What is oh, the, okay. I think it has to do with my 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 system. Just a minute here. It's, I'm asking uh, whether uh, the uh, the issue of uh, recalling. As something legal in Liberia or illegal in Liberia? A recording, are you saying? Recalling. No, that to... rec... Like the recalling of Brandon Samukai, Defense Minister, yes, Police yes, yes. Director. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Yes. Um, the, um, of course, everyone listening to this program, I'm sure, is well aware of the uh, tape recordings that uh, Ms. Corkum and Mr. Johnson apparently made of uh, of government uh, officials, including the Minister of Defense, including the Chief of Police, including certain other uh, high-level officials, including, incidentally, also the Chairman of the Board of the LAA and the Secretary to the Board of the LAA. Um, it is illegal in Liberia um, to record a conversation without the knowledge and, uh, and permission of both parties. Uh, and so um, it is, we submit, illegal to have done what Ms. John, Ms. Corcoran and Mr. Johnson apparently did, which is um, to conceal the fact that they were taping these conversations and then to, uh, to broadcast them against the law. Now, they have not been indicted for those acts. Those, um, the Justice Ministry in Liberia has not seen fit, and perhaps I should say has not yet seen fit, since I'm not privy to their thinking on this, um, to uh, bring charges uh, on the on the basis of the illegal uh, recordings, but certainly that kind of thing is illegal. I happen to be in, talking to you from the state of Maryland right now, and here in the state of Maryland, um, it is illegal uh, to uh, tape uh, a phone conversation or a personal conversation uh, without the uh, consent of both parties to it. That's not true in all 50 states, but it is true here in Maryland, and it is true in Liberia. So we consider that to be a fairly serious matter. Now, of course, you know, why in the world would they do this? Why would they do something so clearly illegal? Um, and one can speculate on that. Um, but we did mention, I did mention in the letter to the uh, Georgia Bar uh, that Mr. have been involved in this kind of conduct, and uh, it's certainly not acceptable conduct. Thank you, Councillor. Let's take the next one. The next one will come from quarter seven. That's eight seven three five. Your name away, quarter turn. That's eight seven three five. Are you with us? Uh, this is Frederick. This is this is Councillor Frederick Jewe. Uh, Welcome to Councillor Stephen. My name is Councillor Frederick Jewe. I'm a Liberian lawyer. Hi. Uh, in, in particular, I represent Ellen uh, uh, Cochran and Judge Johnson. My question to you, uh, you say you are an instructor of international law. You appear to know a little bit more about Liberian law. You have an indictment upon which you're seeking an extradition. My question to you, the indictment alleges three important things. One, in fact, four. One, it alleges the commission of economic sabotage. Mm -hmm. Two, it alleges the commission of theft of property. Three, he alleges the commission of misappropriation and trusted property. Four, he alleges criminal conspiracy. Now, are you aware, my question to you, are you aware of how indictments are drawn in Liberia? How much do you know about Liberian criminal procedure law? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, my understanding is that indictments in Liberia are similar to indictments in the United States. They are accusations. They are allegations. They're not conclusive of anything. They simply announce that the government has determined that there is probable cause to believe that these defendants committed these crimes. Maybe they're not guilty of these crimes. You know, the, the grand jury system that produces indictments, as I'm sure the caller knows, is uh, one that has some controversy around it. And many common law countries 
including England, uh, have long since dispensed with grand jury proceedings and indictments because uh, many people feel that indictments are simply rubber stamps or grand juries are simply rubber stamps for prosecutors. Uh, the old cliche is that in, a, in the United States, a grand jury would indict a ham sandwich if a prosecutor asked them to. Um, well, um, maybe that's true, but there's got to be some filter that uh, prosecutors must pass through if they want to be able to spend public resources in prosecuting a crime. And grand juries have always been seen as kind of a watchdog that's meant to keep the prosecutor honest uh, and make sure that the prosecutor actually has a basis for uh, allegations. And that is my understanding, at least, of, of how the system also works uh, in Liberia. Again, I can't say it often enough. They, these individuals have not been convicted of anything. They are simply being accused, and the extradition treaty permits, indeed, is based on um, the return of a person to the country of origin when he or she has been accused of a crime that comes within the treaty. Counselor, my question is not so wrong that at all. I'm asking you, do you, as an international lawyer, know the process of, of how an indictment is obtained in Liberia? My question comes from the fact that this indictment li lists or enlists four different crimes. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what I'm, where I'm coming from. The criminal procedure law of Liberia provides that an indictment cannot list four or five different crimes in, in, in a single indictment. Reason for that is that the indictment must give sufficient notice to those who are charged. For example, economic sabotage is a first-degree felony under the Liberian law. The imprisonment period is 10 years. Theft of property is a second degree felony under the Liberian law. The imprisonment period is between five to ten years, provided it is a first degree felony. Misappropriation of interested property is a second degree uh, 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 felony. The imprisonment period is five years. Criminal conspiracy is a first degree felony. The imprisonment period is ten years. What notice is, is what notice is this indictment giving to the defendants that are charged for you who? Who, who claim to be an international lawyer, to base an extradition treaty on an indictment that is vague. Well, I'm not asking the, for whether they are convicted or not. Yeah, the treaty doesn't, um, doesn't make determinations or doesn't base its determinations on whether indictments are vague or not. What you're suggesting, what the caller is suggesting, it seems to me, is a... If, if what he's suggesting is correct, I have no reason to think that it isn't, um, that there may be a defect uh, in the indictment under Liberian law. And I know that the um, defense has already moved to dismiss the indictment uh, on one grounds, and that request was denied. Uh, if there are other bases to dismiss the indictment because the indictment is inadequate under Liberian law, then I would have thought the obvious play to pursue that would be to, uh, to bring it before a Liberian court. And if the argument is as clear as the caller suggests, that an indictment cannot name more than one offense, even if um, there is a, uh, uh, an allegation of fact that the fact pattern alleged may come within more than one um, definition of an offense, but if that's Liberian law, then by all means... Uh, the defendants ought to challenge the indictment in Liberian law, and if the indictment goes away, then obviously the extradition request goes away with it. Yeah, Councillor, we're going to take the next one. Councillor Stephen, the next one will come from 5374. Your name is where you call it from. Uh, my name is Isaac Johnny. I'm calling from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, uh, welcome to the show. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Stephen, work, uh, thank you for coming uh, on the show to clarify some in the minds of some Liberians. Uh, we went down the same trend before. My question is, why did you receive a personal call from the President of the Republic of Liberia instead of working in collaboration with the Justice Ministry? Who gave you this contract to indict these people? And if so, why has it come of uh, Mr. Ability, Musa Ability, who was the chairman of the uh, uh, association for which uh, Ms. Pokri was uh, Managing director, has it been data to? Is that the awareness? Yeah, Mr. Billity was indicted. In fact, um, indeed, there were a number of other parties named in the indictment. 
uh, in addition to Corcoran and Johnson. Uh, Musa Billity was the chairman of the LAA board uh, at the time. And the basis for the indictment of Mr. Billity um, has to do uh, with the signatures, the authority that was given uh, for the payments of bank transfers in the first count of the indictment. If you remember when I, when I was describing the counts of the indictment a moment ago, I said that uh, Ms. Corcoran um, authorized two payments to be made to uh, the company that she apparently hired uh, to do work at Roberts Field. And I said, when I was describing the count, I said that uh, she did not go through proper procedures with respect to authorizing the, um, the disbursements. What happened there is that under the LAA rules or the board rules that were in place at the time, um, checks and transfer authorizations had to be signed by the chairman of the finance committee of the board, uh, a man named Masakoi Kamara, and either the chairman of the board, Mr. Billity, or the managing director, Ms. Corcoran. That was the instruction that the bank was given. Now, in fact, apparently what happened was Mr. Billity uh, – pre-signed a bunch of checks. He signed checks that were blank and left them with Ms. Corcoran, uh, who was then able to countersign them and, and obtain disbursements uh, from um, the uh, LBDI, the Liberian Bank for Development and Investment. That shouldn't have happened. Um, Mr. Billity, according to the indictment, was at least careless in his public trust, uh, I mean, just as you would be careless if you were to sign some checks in your personal checking account and leave those blank checks, uh, you know, in, the, in a public place. That would be a pretty silly thing to do. Somebody could take those checks and fill out a uh, different payee's name and an amount of money, and you would have very little defense when, when the money was taken out of your account. And uh, as a public servant, Mr. Billity should have known better than that. Uh, so he is accused as part of the first count of the indictment of having been a participant in um, uh, in Ms. Corcoran's scheme to divert uh, public funds. I think I think that answers the question, does it? No, another question is uh, remain unanswered. Why did you receive a personal call from the president of Liberia instead of the Justice Department? Because they are uh, so the counsel had said that he was hired by the uh, the Ministry of Justice. Minister, yes, I, I received a call from the president. That's true. Um, I did mention that. But but uh, this was simply to explore whether this is some a work that I could do that I you know would be capable of doing. And I said I was capable of doing it. And then I was contacted by the Minister of Justice. And in fact, the Minister of Justice was in the United States very shortly after that and came to see me. Thank you, Councillor. We're going to take the next one. The next one will come from 0749. Your name away, call from Yes, this is Jacob from New York. Jacob, welcome. Yes. Uh, Counselor, yes. I, I had the privilege to read your profile uh, with respect to the interview you gave to Front Page Africa. Mm -hmm. And I'm deeply concerned, concerned for reasons that you mentioned about James T. Phillips. And when I was a child in Liberia, James T. Phillips and the very early in Jordan Salif were prosecuted for subversive activities in Liberia. And they also, considering the record of this current government we have in Liberia, the record of uh, uh, countless reports from human rights organizations, Amnesty, the International Crisis Group, the United States Department, we put over and over that the judiciary system in Liberia it is corrupt that there is no um, separation between the executive and the judiciary. There is a serious influence from the president on, the, on the, uh, the judiciary. So there is no independence, judiciary independence, so to speak. Mm. Charlie, yeah. when the, last, the last concern I have is that as an international lawyer, and as he claims to be, with distinction and given the background of Madame Salif, and what is continuing to hang up our country after, after this government, the, the record of this government, and the record of elements within the government. So take upon yourself to seek extradition treaty, you know, to, pers to, to seek the extradition of Melvin and any country from Liberia. 
Well, you know, well, reasonable well, people I, can disagree. No, no, about... no, 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 no. Let me, let me, let me end my question. Oh, I thought that was the question. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh huh. How, how, how do you how do you how do you how do you reconcile how do you reconcile your professional role, your professional as a professional person, ethically, morally, given the conduct of Madame Salis in Liberia, the record of the government, and the validity of the charges levied against these folks? Okay. Um, as I started to say, reasonable people can disagree about uh, the qualities uh, of the government of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf or of Barack Obama or of, of, of David Cameron. Um, that's what happens in democracies. People disagree about these things. But another thing that happens in democracies is that democracies hold elections. And in 2011, there was an election in Liberia, as you know better than I do. And uh, President Johnson Sirleaf was reelected. It was a democratic election, according to all accounts, and she was reelected. Now, it doesn't mean that every Liberian has got to like her or that every Liberian has got to think that she's good for the country. In fact, the Constitution protects your right to think exactly the opposite. Um, but, uh, but the fact is that uh, this is a government that is committed to uh, the promotion of human rights, and to combating corruption, as I said earlier, is it, has it been 100% successful? Obviously, it has not been. Has it made things better for the Liberian people? Well, I think the answer to that is that the Liberian people seem to think so. At least a majority of them do. But that doesn't mean that it isn't open to people to have reasonable disagreements. So that's the first part of the answer. Now, the second part that asked about, my, uh, about how I reconcile this with professional ethics and this sort of thing. Um, I'm a lawyer. That means I'm an advocate. My job is to uh, represent clients in contentious matters, um, to speak on their behalf, to make their arguments for them in as persuasive a manner as I can. It does not mean that I, as a lawyer, or that any lawyer, um, is uh, personally a representative of his client. He is simply a spokesman for his client. Now, I make no apology, as I said, for the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf administration. Personally, I feel uh, n enormous respect for her um, and um, pride that someone I knew long ago uh, was recognized by the Nobel Committee in uh, 2011. Um, so I'm, I'm perfectly happy and content with, with uh, my relationship with the government of Liberia and with the president of Liberia. But again, that's not really the point. The point is to evaluate not my commitment, or, but the quality of the arguments that I'm trying to make on behalf of the government. And if they're good arguments, they should succeed. Um, and if they succeed, then uh, these two individuals will be extradited to stand trial in Liberia. And if they do not succeed, then at least in the views of the in the view of the um, uh, Justice Ministry and the grand jury members who indicted these two, if they are not extradited, it will mean that, yes, there has been corrupt acts. There have been corrupt, corrupt acts committed in Liberia uh, within the government that were not punished and because uh, the individuals were able to uh, escape the country uh, and uh, from a vantage point across the ocean uh, to be able to defeat extradition. So I don't see any inconsistency there. In fact, to the contrary, prosecuting corruption is precisely what people whose political views are like the callers would want to see the government do more, not less. Uh, Consider, we're going to take the next one. The next one will come from 6965. Your name, where are you calling from? What are your last number? Six nine six five. Are you with us? Yes, this is Dennis from. from oh, welcome to the show, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the time. Personally, I uh, I feel offended by what they are they saying. Yes, sir. Uh, corrupt African leaders who pay a huge amount of money to lobbyists. And uh, we have Western countries and individuals and companies that prop up corruption in, in our country, in our continent. And that's what I find in this case. I don't know, and I feel offended that uh, the council is kind of lecturing us about Liberia, how good it is, or grading our system, and he's not the one usually working because he's been paid to do so. So I, I, I'm just offended by what he's doing. 
I'm offended by his involvement in this case. I think um, he's one of those who is popping up this uh, corrupt migrant government to pay a huge sum of money, waste our money and our resources, just to make their name look good. Thank you. I'm just Thank offended. You. Uh, I don't know how uh, how good this makes my name look. Certainly doesn't look very good with that caller. Uh, but uh, just to make it perfectly clear, and I think it probably is clear, but just to put a fine point on it, uh, I'm not a lobbyist. Uh, a lobbyist is somebody who attempts to influence legislation or attempts to influence policy. I'm a lawyer. I'm making a legal case to the Department of Justice having to do with the proper interpretation of an extradition treaty. That's what lawyers do. And I'm sorry if the caller is offended by that, but uh, I can tell you that having a, a U.S.-based lawyer promoting this extradition uh, is making the system more efficient, not less. And at the end of the day, I hope it will even make it more economical because I can uh, – I am right here in Washington. When the Justice Department has a question, they can pick up the phone and call me, or I can messenger documents over to them, which both of which has happened. Uh, and so the effort here is to promote efficiency, to promote the objectives of Liberia, and, uh, you know, certainly not to promote me. That's not the point. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, we're going to take the next one. It's the first question here. To so those of you who are in the queue, I will say welcome to Liberia Destiny Debaters. With us tonight is the Councillor is Councillor Stephen M. Schoenberg. He's a government lawyer representing the government in the extradition uh, treated for, against Ellen Crockett and George Johnson. And I control, my name is B. Flo from the second. Consider we're going to take our next question, which is the test question. It says, it comes from Sarah Johnson. She would like to know, uh, Ms. Crockett and George Johnson are going around the U.S. collecting signatures from Liberians to remove the government from power. She would like to know that these people, she said, they are no longer Liberians, they are U.S. citizens. What can the government do since, of course, they are U.S. citizens and want to remove a elected leader from power. Is there anything the government of Liberia can do? No, I, do, I don't think there is, and frankly, I, I, I don't think there should be. Um, people are free uh, in this country to uh, go around the country urging that the government of the United States be changed, for goodness sake, much less the government of a foreign country, and they're free to do that. They have constitutional protections. Um, and, um, uh, again, uh, the, the public who are watching this uh, might uh, conclude that they have some sympathy with the line that uh, Corcoran and Johnson are taking with respect to corruption in Liberia and so on and so on, or they might come to the opposite conclusion. People watching them might well come to the conclusion that these are um, uh, desperate acts being undertaken by people who are attempting to uh, to excuse criminal conduct. Um, and again, this would hardly be the first time. As I said earlier, many uh, people accused of crimes defend themselves by attacking the prosecutor. Happens all the time. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it is interesting that um, uh, Ms. Corcoran and Mr. Johnson have suddenly become so negative uh, about the government of Liberia in general and about the president in particular. But it's well known that the president of Liberia extended numerous courtesies uh, to Ms. Corcoran. She had great faith in Ms. Corcoran. She had a personal belief that Ellen Corcoran was going to be the kind of person who should be welcomed back to Liberia. This is a competent, well-educated individual of Liberian birth who wanted to come back to her country of origin and, and, and give something back to the people. That's how she presented herself. And uh, Ellen Johnson clearly believed that and um, was hoping uh, that Ms. Corcoran's tenure, not only as managing director of the LAA, but in any other position she might hold in the government, would be blessings for, uh, for her country of, of birth. Um, so no one is taking any pleasure in this. Certainly the president is not taking any pleasure in this. Uh, this is a matter of deep personal regret for her. But um, it is something that uh, she believes and the government believes needs to be done. And as I said earlier, if it were not done, then the message that would be communicated to the people of Liberia would be, well, you know, if you, if you have this level of education, if you have this level of economic uh, comfort, 
uh, if you have this ability to go back and forth between Africa and the United States, then you can commit acts of, of corruption in Liberia, and nobody's really going to give you much of a hard time about that. And I dare say that some of the callers who have suggested that the government is corrupt and that the system is corrupt and all of that ought to be the ones who are most actively insisting that this kind of prosecution be undertaken, because it's only if this kind of prosecution actually happens that the message will get out to the people of Liberia and to the people of the world that this government means business. Thank you, Councillor. Let's take order uh, 2330. Your name and where you calling from? Yes, my name is E. Jefferson Donald. I'm calling from Pennsylvania. How are you? Good. How are you, Jefferson? Yeah, okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, before going on with my question, I really think just what you said right now, that librarians should not be, like, taking a bike about what you are doing. Because if we really say we want to put an end to this corruption issue within our country, we should be happy uh, to go through the legal process. So if people, if there's an allegation against people, I think they should go there and go to exonerate themselves. But then my question has to do with... Um, the police director for Liberia, Chris Massacre. I don't know whether you really know, but it was Chris Massacre, the police director, who smuggled these two individuals from Liberia back to the United States. My question to you is, is the government doing anything about Chris Massacre smoking this individual who the government has problem with uh, back to the United States as police director of the present government? Well, I've, I've heard, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I have heard the same tape that you've heard. Um, and um, in that tape, it certainly does appear that the uh, director of the police um, was involved in helping them to leave the country. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I suppose if I, if I were president, it wouldn't make me very happy. Uh, to know that he was doing that kind of thing, but but that really is way outside my remit. Um, this is this is a question not only of Liberian law, really, but of Liberian politics. I don't know what the factors are that might weigh in the minds of the president or of the attorney general or of any others uh, of senior uh, levels of the executive branch uh, in Monrovia that would uh, that would determine uh, the proper response to this kind of thing. Thank you, Councillor. Let's take order three eight seven eight. Your name, where you calling from? So my name is Stanley Sewan, calling from Rochester, Minnesota, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, welcome, uh, Councilor Stevie. Um, my question here is uh, the the legal process in Liberia is our uh, in reference for indictment. My understanding that alleged uh, counts occur in the county of Mangibi. Why do you say that it's uh, indictment in Maserato? I mean, I want to know if you have time to look into that. And that's that's a that, very interesting question. I, I have not looked into that. I've not heard anybody suggest that before. That's very interesting. Um, you know, a little while ago we had, as a caller, um, uh, one of the defense counsel for uh, the for the two indictees, um, and uh, he didn't mention that either. So if it is um, arguable, and I don't know whether it is or not, but if it is arguable that the indictment was brought in the wrong county, uh, then that, that might be a jurisdictional bar. I can't imagine uh, why defense lawyers would not have already in invoked that argument if it's a good argument. But I, I don't know. I've certainly, I have, this is the first time I've ever heard that suggested, and I will, as a matter of fact, do some looking into it because I'm curious about it now that you've raised it. Okay, uh, that's my concern. So if you look into that and uh, if you can uh, like the public, that would be great. But uh, that's my, my, my concern. Interesting my point, thank and, and thank you for raising okay. it. I will look into that. Okay. Thank you, God. Councilor, uh, let's go to uh, quarter. Let's go to quarter 0853. Mm -hmm. And even where are you calling from? Oh, hi. Uh, is that me, uh, Mr. Moriza? Yes, uh, that's you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, and thank you, uh, Councilor Rosebaum. I hope I'm, I'm not calling your name wrong. Uh, I really, really appreciate and admire your straightforwardness in answering most of the questions with honesty, clarity, and objectivity. Uh, now that you are going to be prosecuting uh, Ellen Kirkland and Melvin Johnson, I mean, 
Spirit is good for a poor country like Liberia because Liberia like, has been struggling. You know the history of Liberia. But uh, I would just like some clarification on one or two issues. Counselor? Sure. I'm, I'm a novice to the legal and judicial system in Liberia. I'm a scholar in a different perspective of my technologies. But my question is, with your objectivity and honesty in answering most of the questions which are totally admired, what is the worth of this entire corruption case in terms of monetary value? And my, and my next question will be because some librarians, cross-section librarians, are questioning one or two things, good money chasing bad money in economic terms. Why put good money behind bad money? Mm-hmm. What is your compensation as compared to the worth of this crime in terms of, in, in terms of monetary value? And, my, and the next question is, well, Councilor Rosemont, is why wouldn't, that's why I said something, why wouldn't the Attorney General of Liberia prosecute this case looking at other instances where Charles Taylor's son, Charles Taylor Jr., Charles Taylor Jr. was prosecuted in America and sent to jail for almost life, for more than life. And um, he wasn't extradited to Liberia. But Ellen Cochran has to, and, he, and, and her husband has to be extradited to Liberia for persecution. Whereas whatever they do in Liberia is heinous because if you corrupt the poor Liberia, you are also killing people. You are also you are creating a, a disadvantage to poor Liberians who should have Medicare, who should have health, education, and you are bringing it down because you corrupted the country. So that's another interface in my question. Okay. Charles Taylor Jr. was persecuted in America here as a U.S. citizen. Cochrane is a U.S. citizen. Mary is a U.S. citizen. And they are committed a heinous crime in Liberia, and they are in America. Why weren't they persecuted in America here? Instead, they had to be extradited in Liberia. And uh, lastly, but very important, I think I brought up one other thing that what is your compensation? Because you have been very objective and be very honest and, very, and have clarified most issues objectively, honestly. What is your compensation for the legal money? We are Liberia. It's our tax, it's our tax that you are being paid with. What are you being paid, compensated with for, with brother, and as compared to what the crime of any has, has committed in terms of monetary value? That's right. Okay, so let me let me answer that in pieces. Um, you asked about the caller asked about the monetary value of the charges, and I can tell you, uh, because these are matters of public record that were included in the indictment. Count one of the indictment alleges that that's the one about the uh, the work at Roberts Field, the paving work. Um, that alleges um, that approximately one hundred and forty four thousand dollars U.S. Uh, was misdirected at Ms. Corcoran's uh, instance to this uh, company that uh, uh, the indictment alleges did not do the work. So that's 144000 The amount of money at stake in count two is somewhat just under $60,000. I think it's 57000 something like that. That is the amount that appears to have found its way uh, into Mr. Johnson's uh, trust account uh, for no apparent reason. Uh, the third count, uh, the amount of money that Ms. Corcoran was authorized to spend on computers was $19,000. Uh, uh, we have to be a little bit um, uh, imprecise on this one because I, I, I'm not sure, and I don't know that anybody's sure of precisely the value of the machines that she actually did deliver in Monrovia to the secretary of the LAA board, but the likelihood is that it's about a total of, of another $10,000. So that, those are the amounts that are in the indictment at the moment. And, of course, uh, as is always the case with corruption trials, corruption charges, uh, there's much more at stake than simply an amount of money. Um, indeed, uh, in American history, there are many, many, many instances of schemes of corruption uh, that ended up turning on very small amounts of money, and not only corruption, but uh, but uh, people whose uh, reputations were inalterably changed um, by having been involved in small uh, acts of apparent uh, impropriety. I mean, for goodness sake, in the 1960s, uh, a, a man who had an impeccable legal and judicial career of decades uh, found himself uh, having to leave the Supreme Court of the United States and not uh, not uh, securing uh, con- confirmation as Chief Justice of the United States because of a $25,000 speaking fee that he had uh, charged to uh, a- an entity uh, that may- might someday have had business before the court. So the amount of money is, is not the gauge of the seriousness with which the government takes this. 
um, in this case or, or I dare say in any case. Now, the, the caller also asked several times about my compensation. I'm not going to disclose that uh, as a matter of public record, um, but uh, the, uh, I believe uh, that my contract uh, was approved by the PPCC. I don't know, frankly, whether that makes it a public document in Monrovia, but, um, you know, the attorneys have uh, certain kinds of, of privileged communications with their clients. Uh, the privilege in an attorney-client relationship belongs to the client, not to the lawyer. And so my view is always that when there is a privileged matter, if the client chooses to divulge it, that's up to the client. But it is not uh, possible for me to divulge that. And I, frankly, I wouldn't tell you my compensation for regular commercial clients for whom I do courtroom work or any other kind of work, uh, just because uh, it's you know that is a I, I consider that to be uh, something that is held between lawyer and client and not for general dissemination. Thank you, Councillor. Let's take call three five let's, uh, three seven four five. Your name and where you call it from? Sure. My, my name is Fidel Zaza. I'm calling from uh, Minnesota. Uh, thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, D. Flo. Uh, and, and you know, welcome to the show, Fidel. All right. Sure. Certainly. Uh, th- thanks for your clarity. Uh, you know, uh, I know the guy before me mentioned it. Thanks for your forthrightness and, and clarity on all the questions posed. Uh, you know, Mr. Schneebaum. I mean, you you are you certainly seem to be a an honorable and good man. You know, there's two parts of my question now. Uh, I mean, this is not some uh, you know silly ad hominem you know, attack on you know, on you. My, my question, I think you you answered, you mentioned it earlier, was really it's, there's two parts to it. Uh, the first part was, uh, uh, you know, if you can can explain me, if you can can elaborate. On the, the extent of, of your personal relationship with with um, you know Ma- Madam Shirley, I know you mentioned something earlier about uh, meeting her for the first time in, in uh, you know 1986. Um, and and the second part is you no know, as as a good man, uh, you know I so do you understand that the level of, of you know vitriol directed to to, to Madam Shirley by so many Liberians, uh, so many powerless Liberians really. Uh, stemming from her deep involvement in, in the, the Civil War, you know. Uh, so those are the, the questions that, that I, I mean, they're, they're kind of personal, but, but really it, it, it's just I'm, I'm very glad for, for you being on today for your time. Hold on, so, hold on so today. Are you, you asking, are you asking the counselor to talk about her involvement in the Liberian Civil War? Uh, I don't no. think they're discussing that here tonight. Oh no no no! I was just I was I asking if, if he if he understand that the, the level of vitriol uh, that is directed by by a lot you know personal things has been alleged to, by so many Liberians to, to, towards her. It, it's not to explain her involvement in, in, in the war, but it was simply you would if, you would have yeah. the opportunity to talk to Madame Salib on this show. So hold your pieces on that. Mm-hmm, I right. promise you that. Uh, no, I, I sure. certainly uh, am aware uh, of the of the issues that the caller raises. I am aware of them. Um, and and I am aware that uh, uh, you know that that the devastation of that war left virtually no one untouched in Liberia or among the Liberian diaspora. Um, and I know certainly that there are uh, strong resentments held against her by by some Liberians, both inside Liberia and outside. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, people who have those views of her or of her political philosophy uh, are entitled to have them and they are entitled to promote them and they are entitled to make arguments for them as they did most recently in 2011 uh, in connection with the presidential election which of course uh, resulted in her being returned to the uh, to the mansion so um, as far as my personal relationship with her goes is not much to talk about I as I mentioned I knew her uh, when she was living in Washington in the 1980s when she was at the World Bank uh, I respected her enormously then, and I still do. Um, and um, uh, when I was uh, following the aftermath of the Kwiwangpa coup uh, in November of 1985, um, uh, it was clear that the Doe uh, administration was aware of, of her as a potential, uh, uh, re- potential dissident, a potential opposition leader, uh, my sense at that time was that uh, Samuel Doe's government was uh, not, didn't feel itself quite competent to take on somebody of uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's stature, 
And so instead of that, they targeted a couple of uh, young uh, librarians uh, who had been educated in the United States and tried to make them uh, responsible for the Kuang Paku, which was nonsense. Uh, fortunately, the good citizens of Monserrato County agreed with that uh, and acquitted those two individuals at the end of their trial for treason. So, uh, yeah, I know a little bit about this history, and uh, uh, and I don't by any means mean to devalue or undervalue the, the, the passion with which people feel uh, either uh, allied with the president or opposed to her, which is what you would expect in a democracy. And uh, and I think the, the, the vibrancy of this debate is, is a good thing. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. Uh, Councillor, let's take the next caller. The next one will come from 2694. Your name where are you calling from? Yes, I'm calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Earlier, you Oh, okay. You, you got you a uh, different me. number this yes. time around. Yes, yes. Okay, go ahead. I will, I will, have two numbers. Don't you think, Councillor, don't you think that the government of Liberia is very desperate? And are you charging us as Liberians for this interview you are doing tonight? Are you charging us? And the, 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 the diaspora consultant that the Liberian government were indicting, Helen Cochran, and, and, and Madam uh, 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 Helen Cochran and George Marvin for. Are you telling me this diaspora consultant was a fake company in Liberia that did not do any work for the government at the airport? What I'm telling you about diaspora um, is that, first of all, it had, there was no authority for Ellen Corcoran to hire that company. That's, that's number one. There was no track record that diaspora presented. When diaspora was referred to the PPCC by Ellen Corcoran, apparently after she had already committed to paying them public money without authority, when that diaspora was referred to the PPCC, they did some research, and they found that there was no such company at the address that was given, that the telephone number that had been supplied didn't work, that the website that had been supplied didn't work, and they reported back to Ms. Corcoran uh, in, a, in a letter that's a public record um, that they would not approve a sole source contract with Diaspora under those circumstances. And one would have thought that the response would have been, oh, sorry, I got the phone number wrong, or they moved offices, here's their new address. But no, nothing like that came back from her. Now, the allegation in the complaint, in the, in the indictment, um, is that Diaspora did not do anything to earn the 144 or whatever it is, thousand dollars that they were paid. We do know that there was a visit to Monrovia by some Senegalese engineers who may or may not have been uh, connected with Diaspora. Um, this, I, I don't mean to get into the minutiae of the facts of the case. At some point, uh, a jury will have to sort all of this out. But the question of whether Diaspora earned that $144,000 is an open question. The question of whether $144,000 was even vaguely a legitimate amount to charge for the work that they did is an open question. We do know that NACO, the Dutch consulting company that ended up uh, performing the emergency work at Roberts Field, charged much less than Ms. Corcoran had agreed to pay to Diaspora without authorization. Um, so that's, those are the answers to those questions. And with respect, again, to the ad hominem questions about whether I'm charging for this interview, as it happens, the answer is no. But frankly, um, this is a, a question that is between me and my client, and uh, I'd prefer to keep it that way. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Stephen. Let's take caller 6727. Your name is from. Yeah, my name is Aaron, and uh, I'm calling from Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, Councillor, uh, you said that uh, you went to Liberia to represent someone, uh, I think Elmer Glee Johnson or someone in the 1986 uh, accused of a coup d'etat against President Samuel Kedo, and maybe you did not succeed in getting them released. And uh, the legal system, at which time you got to know President Salis? And then you said that the, an extradition treaty exists between Liberia and America since 1939. Why is it that it did not apply during the Charles Taylor situation? Uh, do you think that since you did not win the 1986 case as alleged by you because of the legal system, do you think that the judicial system during the Samaki Do administration 
is different from this present one? Yeah, that's, uh, I do think it's different, uh, although it may be different in degree, it is different. And let's just be clear on what happened in 1986. I wasn't litigating a case in 1986. I attended a trial together with other international observers simply as an observer to open the window so that the world could see what was happening in Liberia. And I think that the attendance of international observers did have the desired effect in 1986 because I don't think there's any doubt but that had the world not been watching, uh, James Holder and Robert Phillips would have been convicted of treason and probably would have been executed. Um, as it happens, they were, uh, not a, they were not convicted. They were acquitted. Um, I gather, I lost track of them both, but I gather that they were both killed during the war. Uh, but these were uh, upstanding young businessmen with great futures ahead of them. Uh, and they were being singled out. At least that was my understanding at the time, and I and I continue to believe that. So uh, again, I wasn't representing anyone. I was simply uh, paying attention to the fact that the opposition to the Doe administration was being uh, hounded in, in in various ways. In fact, I'll tell you, I, I remember that uh, the day that I arrived in Monrovia in 1986, uh, the together with a bunch of other lawyers, I think, I think all of them from the United States, there may have been one or two uh, English uh, members of the team, we were hosted at a, um, at a cocktail party, a reception, uh, by a, a Liberian opposition uh, lawyer. And there must have been oh, 40 or so uh, Liberians in the room and probably 20 or 15 uh, foreigners. And uh, at some point during the evening, which was just meant to be a social evening, at some point, someone uh, clinked a glass to welcome uh, the foreigners to, uh, to Liberia. And he said, as you look around the room and as you meet and shake hands with Liberian colleagues, Liberian lawyers, Liberian judges, bear in mind that every single person, every single Liberian in this room has spent time in prison o over the last 10 years. And I thought that was an astonishing fact to recognize the, the courage of people who were Liberian lawyers and who had the courage of their convictions and who defended uh, their political views and defended the, their constitutional views. Um, and uh, I was very, very impressed. I'll never forget that moment. Now, the, the basic question the caller asked was, have things changed? And the answer is, yes, I think they have. And I think they are changing. I don't think that um, the kind of influence that I saw the executive attempting to bring to bear on the criminal trials uh, in 1986 would happen today. Um, and, uh, you know, again, reasonable people can disagree with me and probably do. Many callers, many listeners to this show will probably say, oh, come on, how naive can you get? But I do believe that this administration is trying to extract uh, the executive from the judicial process. Um, and, uh, if, again, as I keep saying, if it hasn't succeeded perfectly, that's not an excuse for not continuing to try. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, let's take caller 3693. Your name where you call it from. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Steve. My name is George Camaro, calling from Minnesota. Oh, I got a question for you. Uh, my first question will have to do, I listened with, to your interview with uh, the Information Minister, Louis Bryan. And I would like to know, you stated in the interview that Ms. Kirkwood violated the PPC Act of Liberia by not going through a vetting process with the company in which you was talking about, Adil. But I would like to know, my question is, uh, the PPC Act of Liberia said that before the Liberian government get into any contract or any bound marriage agreement, it should go through the PPCI. I would like to know, did you go through a vetting process before earning this contract to Liberia? And my next question, do you uh, understand? Sir, we're going to take one question from you, sir. Okay, one this, this is not a question, D Flo. And another it's thing not, I will have. It's not a recommendation. There's no room for recommendation today. As I said, maybe you are not on. Today we are only Boy, okay, one Okay, then he answer my question. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it was, the question was whether I was whether my contract was approved by PPCC. My understanding is that it was. That's my understanding. Um, and uh, I certainly recognize that. Thank you. That the PPCC Act 
uh, as I understand it at least, requires that a sole source contract of a value of greater than $50,000 U.S. must be approved uh, by the PPCC. That's my understanding. Uh, and I believe, as I say, that my contract was so approved. Um, and that's what I was told. Uh, and in the case of, uh, of Ms. Corcoran, um, the contract that she wanted to uh, award to uh, the company owned by her, her uh, friend from graduate school uh, was of a value much greater than $50,000. She applied for PPCC approval after the fact. It was rejected, as I've explained a few times, and she apparently went ahead anyway. Thank you, Consulate. I would like to take this time, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome my co-host, Samuel Sonegar Ben, to the show. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, thank you, Councilor Stephen, for taking your busy time to come uh, on this program. Uh, this program in the diaspora was established uh, for Liberians uh, last year to understand our three branches of government to interact to keep in a civil discourses. So we we'll keep this civil and discuss the issue. We hope as you come on the show, it shouldn't be the last time. If you had the opportunity, we'll call upon you. We ask you that you come uh, to invite on the fact concerning this issue. Again, Councillor Steven, we say thank you as a co-host and co-founder of this program. Welcome to Library and Destiny Debaters. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind words, and I, I've enjoyed this conversation, and I certainly uh, uh, hope that there are subsequent opportunities, whether in the context of developments in this case or, or other matters of interest to the Liberian community, both inside Liberia and in the diaspora. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, let's take a quarter. Let's go to the list here. So those of you who are waiting, you have to dial star 61 on your phone. That's the only way we can recognize your number in the queue. So, Councillor, we're going to take caller 8270. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Councillor Stevie, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, my question is, Mr. Councillor, I understand that both Judge Johnson and Ellen Copeland are both American citizens. If it is true, had the United States ever extradited its citizen to another country? Do you think you will be victorious in your in your extraditing in extraditing them? And the last question is: Is it legal in Liberia to to appoint an American citizen or a foreigner? So can to we uh, take you one question by quarter, sir? Yeah, Sorry I, for that. I, I understand, understand the where where he's going. That's fine. Uh, okay, so the answer to the first the, the first part of the question: Has the United States ever extradited its own citizens? The answer is yes, it has. Uh, it doesn't do it on a routine basis, uh, but it has. Now, the the treaty with Liberia, the 1939 uh, treaty that was uh, signed during Franklin Roosevelt's administration here, um, says that the treaty shall not require either state to extradite its own citizens. But it does not say that, that neither state may shall be permitted to do that. And so um, we have presented our extradition request to the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice certainly is well aware of the fact that uh, uh, Johnson and Corcoran are U.S. citizens, and we are making, we, obviously we're not trying to conceal that fact. It's a, it's a fact, a uh, verifiable fact. And undoubtedly, the Justice Department will take that fact into account when it makes its decisions on, on how to proceed with this uh, extradition request. Um, I, I think the, the final point the caller was getting at was, was something about whether um, Ms. Corcoran's uh, American citizenship affected her uh, appointment as managing director. I think the answer to that is that the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf administration and its predecessors, I understand, um, have been very eager to welcome back to Liberia the families of emigres um, who uh, who have gone abroad and uh, who've accomplished something, who've gotten education, who've put, uh, who have a business, or who have some level of of achievement that they would like to share. Uh, with those in the country uh, to which they still owe uh, the loyalty of uh, of having family and having been born there, and, and that is uh, so. Somebody like uh, Ellen Corcoran coming back to Liberia would typically be welcomed with open arms. Um, and uh, this administration is, uh, of course, particularly committed to spotting uh, exemplary women 
the president uh, has, has certainly made that one of her most important uh, crusades. She talked about it in her Nobel lecture. She talked about it in her inaugural addresses. Um, and, uh, and so when a, a woman presents herself, uh, a woman of Liberian birth and great accomplishment, presents herself as someone interested in helping the motherland uh, to to rebound from all of the catastrophes Liberia has recently experienced, um, she was a very uh, she was a very attractive catch. Um, unfortunately, um, the facts turned out to be a little different. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, let's take uh, the test question. It comes from Sarah. it comes from Jeremiah. Jeremiah wants to know that uh, he knows that Liberian Liberia Liberians in general are divided on this issue because. This government is seen by many Liberians as a corrupt cartel, a corrupt uh, uh, government. But uh, and there are other Liberians in the diaspora that were involved in corruption, elected corruption in Liberia, and the government of Liberia has never tried to persecute any of them. Why is it that this government has decided to come after Ellen Cochran and George Johnson? It is because of how they went to Liberia and recorded people, or it is a uh, something that the government has decided to send a class message to Liberians in the diaspora that leave from here and go to Liberia and allegedly get involved in corruption? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the answer is the latter. I mean, I think a, a message is being sent, and I think the fact that there is a level of interest in this case that is being demonstrated right now uh, among the callers uh, is evidence that that message uh, is being received. Now, you know, in, in all prosecutions, everywhere in the world are selective prosecutions and everybody who gets caught speeding speeding down the highway and gets pulled over by the policeman the first thing you say is but officer other people were going faster than i was why did you stop me that is always the defense and um in this case why have others not been uh, touched by the administration why have other extradition requests uh, not been filed I haven't a clue. I'll bet you that there are as many answers to that question as there are instances in which people uh, did leave Liberia, uh, leaving behind a trail of corruption, <clears throat> and didn't get pursued. Uh, probably situation-specific answers to those questions. Um, but rather than discussing why the government isn't perfect, uh, why its track record isn't perfect, it strikes me as more sensible to discuss what can actually be done in this case? Um, what, you know, not having a 100% success rate in, in, in prosecutions is not a reason for giving up, not a reason for saying, well, we, we let this guy get, get away or we let these people get away. Therefore, we're packing up our tents and going home. We're never going to enforce the law again. The people wouldn't stand for that, and they shouldn't stand for that. The people who are saying this government is corrupt and this government is, is, is flawed, deeply flawed for all these reasons that people are alleging, those ought to be the people whose voices are the loudest in saying the, if the government needs to turn around and it needs to start going after corruption and without fear or favor. It has to start prosecuting people. And that's I think the argument that says let Corcoran and Johnson go back to Liberia and stand trial. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Stephen. Let's take order. Let's take order at five five two nine. Your name away, calling from. Thank you, Deflo. My name is Robert Dabochin, and I'm calling from the state of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I, I know you guys are going to take one question, uh, Mr. Mr. Stephen. Thanks for giving us your ears, and I think this is, this is a very important uh, question. Uh, I hope you understand the Liberian Constitution and the fact that Liberia Constitution does not recognize dual citizenship. And I hope you are aware that this government violated Liberia's Constitution when it, when, it, when, it, when, it, when it decided to hire two foreigners, or I say one foreigner, to work in the Liberian government. So I hope you are prepared to answer that question in court. Uh, my question to you is this. You talked about uh, the government taking a stand on corruption. Mm-hmm. We are against corruption. We stand against corruption. But we think that when the government is taking a stand on corruption, that stand, the level of concern, and that message that is being sent to Liberia, not just in the diaspora, but Liberia in Liberia, the country, 
should be sent across the board and not selected. Do you understand that along with Ellen Cochran and Melvin Johnson, that there were three others indicted on these particular charges? Uh, this stuff has been going on for the past year or two. And my question is this, and I want you to answer this question precisely. The government has particularly gone after these two in the United States. And again, let me be very clear. We think that they should go after anyone who steals money. But why is it that this government, if the message is to be taken seriously, and if we are in the diaspora who are against corruption, who wants to support the government stand, serious stand, or just stand on corruption, how else do we take them so seriously when you are asked the two guys to go home and answer uh, to corruption questions when you have those in data along with them? I will name one, one individual. Uh, the, uh, the Liberian Football Association president, Musa Beiri, was also in data on these charges. And a few weeks after the indictment, the president praised him as one of her favorite sons in the government and one of those people who have done extraordinary work. Uh, that was two weeks after he was indicted. Why is it they, they why hasn't them started persecuting those in Liberia while we're with Melvin Johnson and Ellen Conklin to return to Liberia? Why? Well, the answer is they have. Now, the, you will recall, or if you know the indictment as well as you seem to know it, you will recall that not only were there individuals named in the indictment, that is to say, uh, the two that we've been talking about, Corcoran Johnson and Musa Bility, uh, Momar Dieng, who is uh, said to be the head of Diaspora Consulting, was also named in the indictment. Two Liberian banks were also named in the indictment, as well as individual officers of those banks. Um, and um, the government has done, the prosecutors have done what prosecutors do in, the, in a situation like this, which is they have attempted to negotiate plea agreements with some of the defendants um, whose guilt, uh, whose um, responsibility uh, appears to be of a lower grade. And so, for example, one of the banks um, effectively pleaded guilty um, to its indictment and offered to return to the government uh, the amount of money that was transferred with improper documentation. And um, indeed, the judge who was hearing that plea bargain insisted that in addition to the restitution, that there be uh, a, a punitive fine. Um, and the bank uh, reject, rebelled at the idea that it would pay more than um, it allegedly had allowed to be misdirected. And that is still going on. That, is, that issue is still percolating its way through the Liberian courts. With respect to musability, um, again, it's a, it's a question of whether the glass is half full or half empty. One could easily say, look, um, you know, the president is obviously a political ally of Mr. Billity, and therefore she said nice things about him, and the, uh, the indictment was probably just a wink and a nod, and it wasn't meant to be taken seriously. But if you look at it from the other side, you could say, how many leaders of governments in Africa would allow their close political allies to be indicted for violations of the criminal law? Why, if Ellen Johnson Sirleaf has some sort of corrupt relationship with Musa Bility, why wouldn't she have stopped him from being indicted in the first place? So it's all a matter, I think, of perspective. It is possible. In fact, I, I, I'm not obviously in charge of what happens in the prosecution in Liberia, but it's possible that Bility will someday uh, plead to some lesser offense. It's conceivable. The charges against him may be dropped. That's conceivable. But let's think about what he's accused of having done. He's accused of having pre-signed a couple of checks, not a couple, a, a set of, of checks and bank transfer documents. I think it's pretty obvious that he should not have done that. He was, he was in a position of public trust. That was a bad thing to do. But it, was it the same level of culpability as what uh, Corcoran and Johnson are alleged to have done? Well, again, reasonable people can disagree, and prosecutors are in the business of having to make those kinds of decisions. It seems to me that if a prosecutor someday decides Billity could be more helpful to the government as a friendly witness um, 
as opposed to uh, being a defendant, um, that's a decision that I would find it very difficult to second guess. It's a strategic or probably even a tactical uh, decision that lawyers make um, as they go about either prosecuting or defending criminal cases. And uh, I think it's all within, within reason. But again, let's not keep letting the, the best be the enemy of the good. What we're seeing here is an attempt to, um, to, to carry out uh, criminal law, to let the rule of law take its course the way it should, and the fact that it can't be done perfectly is not a reason for not trying to do it at all. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. Councillor Stephen, our next question will come from Kora 4380. Your name is Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, William Ponder. I'm calling from Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to the show tonight. Thank you, Dee Flo. Uh, uh, sir, uh, thank you for your appearance uh, in this uh, forum. I have one question. We've had um, we've had the judge and uh, Cockrum here on the call before, and I asked them specifically why they they thought that it wasn't in their best interest to return to Liberia and face justice if they're claiming that uh, they're innocent, and they specifically said they don't have trust in the justice system in Liberia, as well as they had heard while they were in Liberia that the president had put out a death warrant on their heads to have them executed. I would like for you to address those two issues, bearing in mind that I used to work in the Liberian government in the 80s, and you specifically talk about your time in Liberia in the 80s, and I always like to juxtapose and and kind of uh, do comparative analysis between that period of history in Liberia and now. So I would like to, uh, you to address the differences and what you expect uh, in your representation in Liberia if you do go to, to be an observer there on the case, et cetera. Uh, what will be the differences? And whether you think that the lives of those two individuals will be in jeopardy if they proceed to go to Liberia? Thank you. Okay. Well, I I do not, and I'll say unequivocally, I do not think that their lives are in jeopardy if they go back to Liberia, and I do not think that Ellen Johnson Sirleaf has put out a a contract uh, on the lives of these two individuals. Um, And and I I, I think it would be um, a hard sell, at least I hope it would be a hard sell to the people of Liberia, who just elected her for the second time to be their president, uh, to to be persuaded that uh, in fact she uh, is, engages in this kind of behavior, she's some sort of mobster or something like that. I think that's an absurdity. Um, and uh, you know, I think the Nobel Prize Committee got it right, and I don't think that the Nobel Prize Committee frequently awards the Peace Prize to to people who are uh, who engage in, in in that kind of conduct. So um, I don't think their lives are in jeopardy, but I certainly do understand that if you are uh, uh, attempting to avoid justice uh, in, a, in a foreign jurisdiction, that it's perfectly logical that one of your lines of defense would be to attack the prosecutor and to say, I can't, I can't possibly go back to Liberia to stand trial because I'll be killed, I'll be tortured, I'll disappear, whatever it is. Um, and that is uh, absolutely what would, one would expect to see. And, I've, you know, you hear the same thing uh, in the United States, that uh, you hear about all the terrible prison conditions, and, and then people who've escaped to Europe uh, when they've been indicted in the United States will say, well, you know, I can't be returned to the United States because I might be subjected to the death penalty, or I might be raped in prison, or I might have some terrible thing happen to me. Um, you know, no human endeavor is ever 100% uh, predictable. Um, however, I think we can say, I can say with some confidence um, that uh, nobody is interested in killing, or at least nobody in the government is interested in killing uh, Ellen Corcoran or Melvin Johnson. What they are interested in doing is putting them on trial, and if the government can prove its case, they are interested in seeing them uh, condemned as having committed crimes against the government and people of Liberia. Uh, And through that prosecution, the message going out to 
uh, the, uh, the rest of the world, including Liberians both at home and in the diaspora, that says that, uh, look, this administration is attempting to turn the page. What's different from 1986? I think a lot is different. I think in 1986, when, for example, in the case that I witnessed, when the judge himself attempted to enter the jury room to tell the jurors that a patriotic jury would convict these two men, I don't think that would happen today. I, I think that then I saw two Liberian defense lawyers, both of them now dead, Clarence Harmon and James, um, I'm blanking on his name, I'll say, uh, Finley, James Finley, um, who were superlative courtroom lawyers, who by the strength of their advocacy and the strength of their uh, of their knowledge of the law and their understanding of how to try cases uh, managed to bring about acquittals uh, for their two clients. These were really courageous individuals I think about very fondly, um, and I learned a lot from watching them in, in a Liberian courtroom. Uh, I don't think that today uh, the same level of courage is required to represent an unpopular uh, defendant. In fact, I've read some of the pleadings that have been filed by defense counsel in this case in, in Liberia. And the rhetoric of defense counsel in condemning the government and everything the government stands for is pretty strident. I mean, it's pretty bold rhetoric. Um, and nobody's apologizing for that. Um, the, the defense counsel are able, if they want to, to claim that this, this prosecution is totally political in character, that it's corrupt, that the judges are corrupt. They can say anything they want. And those submissions are heard and read and considered, and the judges will rule on them. So that didn't happen in 1986. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. Councillor Stevens, uh, the program was scheduled for two hours. Uh, it's almost about uh, two minutes in Minnesota to be uh, exact of uh, the time. So we're going to take at least uh, two more calls, and then we will give you for your closing statement tonight. Just so Very good. We we'll take two more. Time. Great. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let's see here. Uh, we have a lot of people in the queue. Those of you just joining us, don't forget to dial star 61 if you want to have a say here. We are trying to wrap up this program tonight. So let's take a uh, quarter 0385. Your name away, you call from. Are you there, quarter? 0385. Okay, let's go to quarter 67508. Okay, you just want to listen. That's fine. Let's let's move on to then. Let's go to a uh, let's go to seventy six one five. Seven six one five. Are you with us? Okay. It looks like uh, we yes. have a uh, uh, group of people that just want to listen. Those in the queue don't want to talk. So, Councillor Stephen, uh, it looks like. Uh, that's all the time we have with you, so go ahead and tell us your closing statement tonight. And before you do that, let me take a question here from my own end. What is the timeline that is uh, given when usually there's a, a file, when the, a case of uh, extradition is filed in a federal court? What is the timeline on that for a hmm. hearing? That's, that's, I'm glad for a practical question like that. Um, the law does not lay down a specific timeline. Um, the extradition request was presented by the government of Liberia last September, and in December, the Justice Department communicated to the government um, a, a series of questions that they had, quite a lot of questions, actually. I think there were over 50 questions that they wanted answered. That's around the time that I got involved, and I have answered those questions, and they have asked some additional questions. And so I'm working now with the uh, Bureau of International Affairs within the Department of Justice. Uh, there is a Liberia desk officer, and I'm talking to her. And um, when she has uh, uh, issues that she wants me uh, to uh, address, uh, we do. We are also asking the government to assist us uh, in compiling some records, some documents um, that uh, would otherwise not be available to us, but through the intervention of the Department of Justice may be made available. So I am hopeful that all of this will be buttoned down, gee, I don't know, in the next, if I were to say six weeks, I probably wouldn't be off by much. And when I say all of this, I mean that we have a final submission from the government of Liberia, from the, the Solicitor General, addressed to the Department of Justice through the State Department, um, in which we have laid out all of our case, 
we have produced all of the evidence that they uh, want to see, um, and that the Justice Department will then make a decision as to whether to proceed. And if they do proceed, then the, the cases will be heard in United States district courts, that is, federal courts, in the two judicial districts in which the defendants reside. That is, in the case of Mr. Johnson, the Northern District of Georgia, in the case of Ms. Corcoran, the District of Massachusetts. And the cases will be presented by the U.S. attorney, who is the chief federal prosecutor, before a federal district judge. Um, these are civil cases, that is, the standard of proof is um, preponderance of the evidence, not beyond a reasonable doubt. These are not criminal prosecutions. Um, and if at the end of the day the extraditions are ordered, then the two defendants will be sent to Liberia and they will stand trial according to the indictment. So I can't be terribly precise about the timeline. Uh, lots of things could disrupt it. Um, and, oh, incidentally, I should mention, I think I've alluded to this already, but I want all listeners to be clear on this. When the extradition requests are presented to the federal courts in Boston and in Atlanta, the defendants will have every opportunity to defend. Now, they won't be able to defend by saying they're not guilty of the crimes because that's not the issue before the court in the context of extradition. That's for Liberian courts to decide, not U.S. courts. But they will be able to make whatever arguments they, they want to make. For example, that these are political offenses or uh, that the indictments were improperly rendered, as one or two of the callers have, have, have suggested today. Um, they will have all of those opportunities uh, before a, a federal judge uh, with the United States flag behind him or her. Um, and um, uh, if they succeed, then they won't be sent back. If they don't succeed, then they will be sent back to Liberia, where they will stand trial in uh, a proceeding that will undoubtedly be watched very closely by the United States government, by NGOs like Amnesty International and other organizations that make it their business to monitor trials that have potential human rights implications, uh, and um, uh, the, the justice system will work the way it's meant to work. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. Councillor Stephen, let's take the final caller for tonight in the uh, in the queue here. Let's go to caller six four nine four. And where are you calling from? Caller six four nine four. Are you with us? Hello. Yeah, apparently not. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh. Yes. Can you hear us, sir? Yeah, I'm hearing you, sir. We have to wrap it up. We are almost out of time here. Uh, you are the last person in the queue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good, evening, good evening, sir. My name is Jay Balapagdolo. I'm from San Nicolas City, New Mexico, Polo, Liberia. And uh, my question to you, sir, is this. What confidence do you have in the Liberian justice system? And uh, what confidence do you have in the Liberian justice system if these people have been uh, extradited to Liberia? Will they have a full protection? And if the full, full protection will be given to them, who's going to provide that? And uh, my last question to you, sir, do you believe... Uh, we are taking just one question. The time is up for the okay. counselor. We have two hours yeah, okay. here. We'll be here for two hours. Well, right, you know, you, I, I, I do have some confidence in the Liberian justice system's ability to do what justice systems are meant to do, that is to determine guilt or innocence of charges that are brought by the government where the government has to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. I say I have some confidence. What I mean is... I have no doubt that it is an imperfect system, just as the courts before which I appear on a regular basis in the District of Columbia are imperfect. And maybe they're imperfect to different degrees. I'm not sure of that. But um, the United States and Liberia have an extradition treaty that is founded on mutual respect for each country's judiciary. I know that there have been times when Liberia's judiciary has probably not earned that respect. And I dare say there might have been times in which the United States judiciary has not earned that respect because of things like racial discrimination and the difficulty, the extraordinary difficulties to which black Americans have been subjected uh, at different times in our country's history, even inside courtrooms where things should have been different and should have been better. So is it perfect? No. But I believe that if Corcoran and Johnson are extradited to Liberia, I believe that they will have a fair trial. And you don't need to take my word for that. I believe they will be very well represented by defense counsel who are accomplished, 
who are experienced, who are intelligent, wise people who will do their best to demonstrate their client's innocence, who will do their best to impeach the validity of the charges against their clients. And that's how it's supposed to work. That's how the adversary system is supposed to work. The government is supposed to put its best case forward, and the defense is supposed to put its best case forward. And the system is not symmetric. The government has a much heavier burden of proof. All the defense has to do is to show that there is cause for doubt. Once there's cause for doubt, the fact finder should acquit. And so the government has the uphill battle here, not the defendants. And um, if the government has the opportunity to, pr- to put on its case, it will have to carry that heavy burden. And I don't know what the outcome will be. I don't know. I don't know whether they are guilty of the offenses. All I know is that there is sufficient basis to believe that they are guilty to justify having a trial under the legal system that they offended against and that is the legal system of the Republic of Liberia, and that trial should take place in Monrovia, and it should take place pursuant to all of the legal guarantees that we've been talking about this evening. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. Councillor Stevens, uh, we have 866 callers, and for those of you who are staying in the queue, I will, ask that, uh, it's, I will extend my apologies to you guys and to everyone here that uh, we have come to the end of this program. And Councillor Stevens, please go ahead and tell us, uh, give us your closing remarks tonight. Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to uh, to Liberians, both in Liberia and uh, and in the diaspora. Um, and I, I hope what what I have tried to do tonight is, uh, I think, a couple of things. One very important one is to show this is not some sort of political vendetta. It is not a battle between the two Ellens. Um, it is not a matter of uh, personal. Um, vindictiveness or or personal uh, irritation, Um, what is at stake here from the perspective of the government is an important principle. The government believes that it has evidence in this case of corruption that took place uh, in high high places in a Liberian government agency, the Liberia Airport Authority, and when it determined um, what the government believes happened in this case, it believes that the uh, facts, as alleged, amount to criminal acts. Um, And it is important, the government believes, and I do too, it is important that when the person accused of these kinds of acts is a person who is well-off, is a person who is well-educated, a person well-traveled and and well-healed, uh, it is all the more important that the government demonstrate that uh, having those advantages does not give you uh, the right, the opportunity um, to engage in corruption, to engage in graft, to engage in this kind of misconduct without consequence. Again, nobody is being railroaded here. The idea is simply to prosecute this extradition to the point where the defendants will have an opportunity to be heard, where the state will bear the burden of proof of their guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and if the state cannot carry that burden, so be it. But The rule of law requires that there be this opportunity for for testing the state's hypothesis. The state, this administration, have not gotten it right 100% of the time, and I understand that there is a lot of political resentment against the president, a lot of personal resentment among some quarters uh, against President Johnson Sirleaf. But she is the president of Liberia, and she was elected to a second term. She was elected with a mandate, and that mandate includes the obligation to reduce the incidence of corruption, to do something about corruption. This case is an example of her attempting to carry out that mandate. And the fact that the mandate has not yet been perfectly adhered to is, I submit, not a grounds for criticizing her. Indeed, she should be criticized precisely for not pursuing cases like this one. So there's nothing personal here. It's not about Corcoran. It's not about Johnson. It's not about Johnson Sirleaf. It's about the rule of law. It's about the obligation of the government of a developing country that has been through the kinds of torture that Liberia has been through, getting itself right with due process, getting itself right with the rule of law. And that's what this president is committed to. And that is what I, in my small way, am trying to help her to accomplish. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. Councillor Stephen, I would like to say thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It was epic, informative having you on, and we wish you good luck. 
Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, and goodbye to everyone. Ladra Distant Debaters will be back tomorrow. Okay, then. All the best.